We're going to new chapter tonight, John chapter 13. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's something good in this, something I like, something I happened upon several years ago. Um, I've, I've told a lot of my testimony over the years, how I found things in the Bible, how uh, God just opened up certain things to me. And um, 1997 in November, uh, God asked me or said, we're going to study Bible prophecy. And I went, wee, wee, and thought we were going to have a lot of fun with it. Boy, was I wrong. And I wasn't wrong in a bad way. It was more fun than I think I've ever had in my life. Um, because once I had certain things settled in my mind that, that God would, had presented to me in the scriptures, like, it's right, don't change any words in it, leave it alone. Once I had that one, I'm going, okay, that this will be fun. Um, then I just, I read, I read, I read, I read, I read. I, I, it's like I couldn't read enough of it. And um, along the way, God began to show things to me. It's like in Isaiah when he says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. And beginning to see how things in the Old Testament were tied to things in the New Testament. They weren't two completely separate books. They were made sort of like a, a husband and a wife. They were made to be together. They were made to complement one another and, and help one another. Help one helps you understand the other. Whether if you're reading the New Testament, then the Old Testament helps you understand it. If you're reading the Old Testament, the New Testament helps you understand the Old Testament. And then certain phrases began to jump out at me. And especially when I began to study numbers in the Bible. And there's a particular phrase that um, we're going to look into tonight. We're going to contrast it very briefly with uh, something that we find in verse 2 of John chapter 13. But here in a minute, I'll tell you how many times it's mentioned in the Bible and, what, and, and the significance of that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer first, because I need it. And I ask that you pray for me. Pray for the things that uh, I have in my heart. They are serious issues. And... Um, just pray that God um, will do some good things in some people's lives that really, really need it. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We do thank you, Lord, for uh, you being good to us. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you've given us. It's so simple. And the Father, the salvation you've given us through this book, your word, Lord, it's just, I love this book. I love the things that you have in this book. I, I need the things that are written therein. They're part of my life. And Lord, I wish and my heart's desire is that I could preach long enough in this world to make it as many Make it as part of as many people's lives as I possibly can. Because I don't see how anybody can get through this life without, without this book. I, I just don't see it. I can't. So, Father, bless your word tonight. And Father, you know the heaviness that's in my heart. And you know, Lord, the, um, the spiritual nature of it that I am dealing with currently. Uh, Lord, you know the physical, emotional uh, aspect of it that I'm also dealing with. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, for your help tonight, that 
in my weakness, Lord, you and your word would be strong in these people's lives and in their hearts. And Father, just we pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes to beautiful, wonderful things. Help us to behold wondrous things out of your law, the Bible says. And Father, in order to do that, we have to read it. And we have to believe it. So Lord, help us to believe these things, meditate on these things, take them home with us, study them for ourselves, Lord, and use those things however you wish in each person's life. Give us a blessing tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Amen. John chapter 13, uh, we're going to take a turn here um, in in the story of Christ according to John. Each one of the Gospels, uh, by the time we get to this, we're usually at the Passover Supper. This is where we're at now in the Gospel of John, and it's where we discover in each one of the Gospels, it's where we discover who the traitor is, who the Judas is. And the Judas just happens to be named Judas. Just like Einstein just happened to be named Einstein. And he got tired of all the kids calling him an Einstein because he was so smart. But anyway, John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, why is that significant? Why does it have to be at the feast of the Passover? Because the meaning of the Passover was this was God's atonement. This was God's salvation of his people. This is how he saved them from Pharaoh, from being in bondage in Egypt, from being slaves there, from the cruel authority they were under. This was how God was going to save them. They were to commemorate the Passover every single year. And there was a reason why God wanted them to do that. It is because he wanted them to remember it all the way down to the time when the real Passover lamb was going to show up so that Jesus could sit with his disciples and say, you see this bread? Your fathers ate this bread in the wilderness. This bread was served the night that, that our forefathers walked out of Egypt. Well, let me tell you who this bread really is. See this cup? Far, our fathers drank it on the way out of Egypt. Our fathers drank it in the wilderness. Our fathers drank it uh, often throughout their history. But let me tell you why we do this every year. It's because this cup actually is the New Testament in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. He was basically changing the entire meaning of the Passover from just a ritual to remember a salvation from the past to something that they did to commemorate a salvation that is eternal and forever. Somebody say amen. So the, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of this world under the Father. How does he know this? We're going to find out in a minute. Having loved his own which were in the world. You know, that includes us. It does. It includes us. When we get to John 17, you're going to see a prayer that Jesus prays. And he prays this prayer, I believe, for the entirety of his body, the church. The whole thing. Not just the ones who were there at that time, but... All saints from that moment forward, probably even for that moment backward. But he's praying it. He loved his own which were in the world. This is the same Jesus who loved David, even though David was his father. Christ was David's Lord. This is the one who loved Abraham. This is the one who loved Isaac. This is the one who loved Jacob. This is the one who loved the 12 tribes. This is the one who has loved them all, all of this time. This is the one who said to them in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7, 
when they, or Deuteronomy 4, one of the two, when, when God said, don't think that I picked you because you were the most people of the earth. You were the least among the people. But I picked you because I loved you. And isn't that why we marry somebody? Or isn't that why we choose to want to be with somebody? It's because we love them. We care about them. And we would do anything for them. Somebody say amen. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. When he said it is finished, he said that out of his love for us, letting us know that from now and forever, our transgressions are covered. And supper being ended. Now watch this. We're going to have a contrast here. Supper being ended. The devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So we have the devil entering into Judas Iscariot. And now they're one entity. This is the only place in the Bible where Satan himself actually entered into a human being. It's the only record that we have. We know that there were other people who were possessed by a single demon or a legion of devils. But this is the only person that we are aware of that Satan himself entered into. Satan, it's like Satan is saying, this is the single most important murder I have to commit. And I'm not going to leave it up to any of my, my other stupid devils that are under me. I'm not going to let them foul it up. I'm going to do this one myself and I'm going to get it right. And we're going to kill God's son and that'll be the end of it. I'll win. That's what he thought. So he entered his, into Judas Iscariot. However, look at verse 3. Here's the contrast. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given, and I want you to do me, I want you to do this, underline these two words, all things. All things. Sounds simple, doesn't it? I promise you, if you'll sit down with your Pure Bible Search software and spend a couple of hours looking at every verse in the Bible where the phrase all things is mentioned, you will, it will not be, I don't care if you did miss Bob Barker, I don't care if you did miss the news, I don't care if you missed... One life to give, one, as the world turns, I, I don't know what's on anymore. I promise you, you will not have missed anything. Okay? Have given all things into his hands. And that he was come from God and went to God. So here's the contrast. Satan entering into Judas, the son of perdition, which is a name for the Antichrist. God giving all things into the hands of Christ. These two contrary men now have their instructions on what they're going to do. And a little thing is going to be carried out. It's the war for man's salvation is going to be carried out by these two men and each one of them believes that they're going to win only one of them can and only one of them did but just so you'll know where i'm going with this hold your place there john turn to revelation five this is this is god giving all things into his hands. 
John, uh, Revelation 5, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book to loose the seals thereof. No, notice that it's a book. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and of the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. The one that sat upon the throne is God the Father. The Lamb is Christ. All things are in that book. Okay? All things now are in that book. It is, it is similar to... Um, if, if you and I, if you and I are still alive when Queen Elizabeth dies, which we're not sure, um, then we will see a coronation of a king. And you will see, if you haven't seen the first coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, you will see them place things into her hands to hold. One is an orb with a cross on it, it represents the earth. The cross at the top represents the earth ruled over by Jesus Christ. That's, she's the head of the Church of England, okay? So it has religious, still to this day, religious symbolism. But then she is given also a scepter in her hand. And that scepter gives her the authority to rule over the kingdom, the United Kingdom, okay? In this case, it's not a scepter, it's a book. It is the authority, it's what Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 10. Lo, I've come, in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God. So underline that little phrase, all things, and then we're going to kind of go through the scriptures and see how this plays out. First, we'll look in the Gospels. John chapter 3, we're going backward a little bit. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath, he's going to say it again, hath given all things into his hand. He says it here. And what, and what do we know that God has given to his Son? Is that book. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And I've made mention of this before. Those people in this world who choose to live unrighteously, when the wrath of God appears on this world, you will, you will look for a cave, to dive into and pray that the rocks of that cave fall down on your head rather than face the wrath of the Lamb of God. That's how fierce it's going to be. People want to make God out as only a God of love. He is a God of love. In fact, God is love, the Bible says. Okay? However... He is also just, and if he weren't, there wouldn't be anything worth serving if God was not a just and reliable God. Amen? Um, right now, the election in Kenya is disputed, and it's in the hands of the Supreme Court judges in the nation of Kenya. They're hearing, we were listening this morning, they're, we're, they're hearing the arguments from both sides. And all of that, the whole thing now, is no longer in the hands of the people. They've cast their votes, not in the hands of each of the candidates. It is in the hands 
of the Supreme Court of Kenya. They will decide the fate of their nation one way or the other. They have been given and delegated that authority. You pray for those judges. And I mean it. Because we are loved by some and hated by others in Kenya. And if the ones that we are hated by prevail to take the government in Kenya, they will more than likely try to exact their revenge upon our ministries in Kenya. Okay? So you pray for those judges. Amen? It's in their hands. Um, Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed, for so it seemed good in thy sight. There's that phrase, all things. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. There he is saying it again. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Anybody tells you they know who God is, but it's not been revealed by the Son. They don't know who God is. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And, and see, this is how this, this is connected to that. I, and I just didn't hook it together. But he, after he says... Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus then says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I can tell you, folks, I am heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is is light. And I know what I need to do is take some time to cast my burdens upon him and trade burdens because the yoke and the burdens that I carry oftentimes are way too much for me. It's not easy to do that. We want to hold on to it. We want to retain it. We want to think that it can't be fixed unless we fix it. That's human nature. And here I am, the doctor, telling you patients what you should do. But the patients say, hey, doc, if it works for us, I get it. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 1. All things were made. What was? All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. See how this phrase all things. See how they all kind of glue together. By the way, I didn't tell you how many times they're in the Bible. The phrase, all things, 220 times. That's a number related to the number 22. The number 22 is for revelation. The Bible has 66 books. That's 22 times 3. The 66th book is called the book of Revelation. And it has 22 chapters in it and it's the revelation of jesus christ and the phrase all things is found 220 times it, it's showing you that it all things are to be revealed who can just for a minute who can think of a verse with the phrase all things in it that we haven't covered yet everybody anybody except melissa 
Go ahead, Chris. There you go. I see ya. He has freely given us all things. Alicia. Melissa. There you go. All things. Now see, see how that, that one simple little phrase. Now, if, if we believed what I was told in Bible college, that the real and only true Bible is written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. Could you do that, what we just did in those three languages? No. Uh-uh. Wouldn't work out. So Isaiah 14, the Holy Ghost gave the instructions for how three unknown tongues were to be handled. Is that only one should translate them. Only one should interpret them. And with this Bible, we have the one interpretation of three Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek tongues that to us, we, we can't even read the letters, much less understand the words. And yet God has them all interpreted for us so that when we read phrases like all things, it makes sense in our mind because they're connected to all the other places where it says all things. Uh, John three thirty five. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. There it is again. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. John four twenty five. The woman saith unto him. I know that. Mes Watch this. Remember what I said? 22 is the number for Revelation. John 4, 25, the, the, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. He's going to tell us everything. He's going to show us the will of God, the ways of God, so that they're not a mystery to us. So that, you know, I... I've seen in my life, and I haven't explained this in a long time. In my younger days, I knew, I knew some things right. I knew some things were wrong. But there was a lot of gray areas in my life. And I didn't understand if they were right or wrong. The older I got, the more I read the scriptures... The more I experienced life, the more mistakes I made, the more good things that I did. You know what started happening to all those gray areas? They started disappearing. And I was able then to take things and say, this is wrong. This is right. And God literally, through the pages of his word, is showing me in my life what's right and what's wrong. And the gray areas, they just get smaller and smaller all the time. There's some things that I just don't have to stand here and prove to you how wrong they are. Because you've seen it before, you know it, and you just know it's wrong. I, if I come out here wearing a dress, a lipstick, and wig, high heels, pearls, and a purse. Yeah, you just know there's no gray area in that one, right? Okay. The shoes don't match the purse, Pastor. What are you doing? John 5, 20. For the Father loveth the Son. Look at this. And showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will, sh he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you what? All things. Revelation. And bring 
all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You would be amazed at times when you are talking to somebody and God is giving you words to say and verses of scripture come flying out of you and you go, where in the world did that come from? I only read that like once. It wasn't your memory. It was the Holy Ghost bringing all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay? John 15, 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things. Here it is. That I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. How? Through the same book. Through the same book that Jesus unseals. Uh, John 16, 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Now that applies, in my opinion, it may apply in a lot of different ways. But let's think of it now as a will and a testament. The father sees the son as an heir to all things. And so he gives his son everything that belongs to him. But of course, the Bible says that now that we are in Christ, Jesus doesn't just get to keep them all by himself. In fact, he doesn't want to. He shares Everything that he has with the people that he loves. I don't mind telling you that I try to convey that to someone today and failed miserably. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. And shall shew it unto you. What is it you don't know about the Bible or from the Bible? What are things that you would like to know from God through the Bible? You ask God who giveth wisdom to all men liberally. The Bible It's the only the only place in the Bible you call God a liberal. Okay? God is not the one piling up homeless people, defecating in the streets in San Francisco, California. He's not that liberal. But when it comes to getting wisdom, all you have to do is ask. And God will give it to you liberally. Because that's what he does. And how will he do it? Through the book. Through all things that he has given to the Son. And now the Holy Ghost, when we read it, will show us even things to come. He'll show them to us. John 17. In fact, turn there. And a little bit more about why Jesus went to the cross. But they call it the high priestly prayer. It's the only place in the Bible where the phrase Holy Father is mentioned. And it's not directed toward the Pope. In fact, it is blasphemy to call a man Holy Father. Blasphemy. Outright blasphemy. But in John 17, there's so many beautiful things here, and we'll get to those. But in verse 6, Jesus said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Who were those men? Peter, James, John. The others 
that are listed as the 12 apostles. The men who from their mouths and from their pens originated the New Testament. He said, I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me them me, and they have kept thy word. Whoever preaches my funeral, I want to be able to have lived my life up to the very end well enough for whoever preaches my sermon, my funeral, to say, Mike kept God's word. Now they have known, here it is, that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. So I mean, compare it with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you have Moses and Moses is hearing from God. He's, God is himself is writing the Ten Commandments on here. But then God is giving Moses the laws that he wants Israel to live by. Moses is writing those down. In the case of Jeremiah, uh, God said, Jeremiah, open your mouth and I will put my words in your mouth and you shall go and speak the words that I have put in thy mouth. In the case of Ezekiel, a book comes down, literally a scroll of a book comes down from heaven with you know God's hand bringing it down. And he tells Ezekiel, take that book out, of, like he did Jesus. Take that book out of this, out of my hand. Eat that book. And it has words in it. Now go tell my people the words that are in that book. Because you now have them in you. I want you to tell them to those people. It's the method of transmission of God sending his word down to those men who faithfully wrote them down. Isaiah saying, I'm a man of unclean lips. And so an angel takes a coal off the, the fire in heaven from the altar and puts it on Isaiah's lips and purges his lips. And now Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Now God has purified his mouth. Now God can use him to speak his word. Now in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 1, it says, God who at sundry times and in uh, times past spoke unto us by his servants, the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So God gave Christ all the words that he wanted in the New Testament, gave them to Jesus. Jesus got the Holy Spirit got them from Jesus, gave it to Peter, gave it to Paul, gave it to John, gave it to Luke, gave it to those men to write those words down. We have absolutely an absolute 100% guarantee that the words we're reading came from God himself. No doubt whatsoever in my mind. That's something else that I failed to accomplish today. John 18, Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him. Did he know they were coming? Did he know Judas was going to betray him? Sure he did. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Why? Because the Father had given all things into his hand. That should come upon him, went forth and said unto him, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Jesus knew all of this. This is why he wrestled 
in the garden of Gethsemane the night before. He knew what was, he knew what was ha happening. He knew what was going to, what is, what was going to befall him. He knew that he was going to receive the stripes. He knew that they were going to beat that crown of thorns into his skull. He knew that he was going to hang on a cross and suffocate for nine hours. He knew that. And yet he did it anyway. Romans chapter 8. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, here it is, somebody quoted this one, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things do. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice that he called, did predestinate, justified, glorified. All that's in past tense, isn't it? He's already done it. To you and in you. Already. It's done. It's over with. How many works must you perform between here and you meeting God for God to accept you? He already has. He already has. What shall we say then to these things? Verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? See how it works? Just those two words. Two words. And yet the meaning all throughout the Bible is absolutely profound. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who in here has ever felt like, now even after you saved, you still feel condemned every now and then for things you've done? Be honest, I am. All you got to do is read this, and that will go away. It should. Because God's already telling you who's going to, who is, the, what did he say to the woman caught in adultery when they drug her out? And Jesus said, he is without sin, cast the first stone. They all left. And Jesus said to the woman, is there any here that condemneth thee? No, none, my Lord. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And that's what he says to us. Who's condemning you? Now, I get it. Sometimes our biggest condemnation, Roy, doesn't come from anybody except us. Okay? And I'm not saying that to single Roy out because Roy's not the only one that does that. We condemn ourselves over things we know we've done and we should have never done. Okay? But understand, God doesn't condemn us anymore. You might have the devil telling you, oh, you did, you did that, you should have never done that, that's, wh that's why you're going through this, sure as the world. No. Mm -mm. Last two. Revelation, tw and by the way, there's a bunch more. I cut a lot out of this. Revelation 21.5, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all Things new. You fouled up in life. I get it. But I serve a God who can make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And then Revelation 21 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. 
I want Mars and the moon. Okay? Or, when, wait, I tell you what, I, before I say anything, I want to search out the entire universe. And then I'll tell you which part I want. And then you can have the rest. All things. Take some time, get that software, type in all things, spend a few hours looking at every one of those verses. Okay? It will not be time wasted. It won't be. Okay?